Okay, it's 11.02, so why don't we begin? Um, so uh, <clears throat> I'm Anna Mary Consalvo, and I'm very pleased to be uh, having been asked to uh, share some of what we know and understand with you. And I uh, have the honor of co-presenting today with Dr. Julie DeLello, um, who is uh, an associate professor of STEM education, also at the University of Texas at Tyler. And um, we've been asked to share um, some tools uh, for effective online assessment practices. And it's our understanding that you um, at the University of Belize are transitioning to online education to um, finish your semester. So you have another five or six weeks or so to go. Um, so with that said, let's begin. Um, right, so we'll, do, if it's still a tiny number, well, let's just hold the questions if you would and let us um, give you the information that we have and mute your mics if you don't mind. And our webinar poster. Um, so the plan for today is really in um, three parts. Uh, so we, we addressed some of the principles of assessment last week in the assessment webinar, but we're just gonna review some basic understandings without repeating what we did last week. And um, the main chunk of this will be Dr. DeLello, who will uh, uh, kind of curate for us an array of free to educators online tools that are either uh, primarily about assessment or contain significant components of assessment. Um, and then we'll return to our guiding ideas and take questions. So a working definition of assessment is that it's a formal attempt um, to determine student status with respect to educational variables of interest, okay? So formal means structured, deliberate, systematic, or planned. And educational variables of interest is basically whatever the professor is trying to get at. And for traditional reasons to assess students, whether or not we're in an online environment or not, is to determine their current status, to monitor their progress, to assign grades, and to determine one's own instructional effectiveness. Um, so all of these are used to help us as educators make decisions. So for example, the, the student's current status, which instructional objectives to uh, maybe turn the heat up under, uh, monitoring students' progress. So that helps us decide what we need to focus on. Again, what we need to turn the heat up under and maybe leave go some of things we can put on the back burner. Um, and which students get which grades. And finally, whether or not our own effectiveness um, can use a little bit of tweaking. Um, and so formative assessment is, well, we have two kinds, right? We have formative and we have summative. So formative, if you look at that word form at the beginning of it, it's, that's really what it is. It's to, uh, to help, it's a scaffolded way of taking a look in and seeing if students are understanding what they're supposed to do. So it's five key strategies is really to clarify and share learning intentions, to engineer effective classroom discussions and learning tasks that elicit evidence of learning, uh, provide feedback that moves learners forward, that activates students as the owners of their own learning and activating students as instructional resources for one another. So formative assessment is uh, you can actually be moving students toward their final projects or their final exams with these, with these smaller steps that build into that and that help us as instructors decide how we can continue to teach. And so summative assessment is really basically just assigning a grade. Um, and uh, so Popham has, uh, I think, a, a good let's remember moment. Um, 
that the summative and the assessment, the summative assessment function can be used as part of that formative assessment process. So, <clears throat> so here we are, we're in this culture change moment, right? So all of a sudden we're all being thrown into online teaching, period. And so three helpful guidelines, really. First, it's be calm and pause. So that means we all need to take a breath and do that fairly frequently. We need to be straightforward and clear. So with heightened anxiety about everything, I think uh, student and our own ability to process information uh, is not quite what it might be at a, at a better time. So we need to sort of acknowledge that and be kind to ourselves and to our students. And third, uh, try to create simple solutions. So <clears throat> as educators, I wouldn't suggest that we, uh, we learn uh, 10 new tools. No, I think if you learn one or two uh, and you share them in a linear and understandable way with your students, that's probably, that's probably um, a good thing to aim for. And so um, just to remember that everyone is wobbly, uh, that for our students, reliable devices and internet may be an issue. Uh, to trim and focus your course, really we've all had, anybody who's done this, we've, we've had to trim away um, things that we can trim. Uh, you, a clean and orderly presentation of your uh, instructions or your content is important. Um, and asynchronous teaching is less stressful than synchronous teaching. If you have, you know, be there at 11 o'clock kind of teaching, uh, if we can make that not um, required, perhaps. Um, but it, it can be complicated with students and their lives and their devices. Have predictable due dates. Try to incorporate specific online office hours and streamline, 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 and build in small steps toward bigger projects to ensure student success. Um, this is, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, but I felt it was wor worth just showing today that these, this lower level remembering up to understanding, up to applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. So then over here, we have some of the products. So certainly remembering and understanding can be part of that formative phase. You know, perhaps applying and analyzing might be something that you want to incorporate in your summative assessment, maybe even evaluating or creating if you're on an upper level course. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. DeLello. I'm going to stop my screen share, and Dr. DeLello will start hers, and we'll see you um, when that. Uh, just hang on a minute, please. Good morning. Give me just one minute, and I'm going to share my desktop with you so that you can see my presentation. All right, so this morning I'm going to talk to you about some tools. Let me move this um, far out of the way. Second. On assessment and feedback, some of these tools are formative and some of these tools are summative, and, and most of the tools you can use both ways. The tools I'm going to show you are free, and many of them right now, because of the COVID-19, are premium tools that you can get if you sign up now and you don't have to pay the premium price. So you get the, ex the extra features that you normally wouldn't get. Um, I am an associate professor in School of Ed, as Anna said, and I'm also the director for the Center for Teaching and Learning. So we do a lot of professional development out of our offices. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, moving away from standardized testing. I know that for a lot of subjects, um, it's very important that we test our students. And we tend to sometimes give a lot of multiple choice tests, especially if we have large classes, because they're a little easier to grade. If we look at what we really want from the students, 
there are what we call the four C's or the five C's, and that's communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. And these are the skills that we want our students to walk out of our universities with um, and go into the job force with. Whether you say you can or not, there's really no way that you can stop every student from cheating. I mean, students will find a way. And so a lot of times people say, well, I need a multiple choice test that students can't cheat on, that is randomized, that is, you know, this and that and, and the other. Um, I've seen numerous ways that students cheat, whether they have two monitors, they have a phone in a monitor, even if you have a room set up where you're being looked at, there's ways that students can cheat. So how important is it that you give a standardized type of quiz or a standardized type of test? And so I want to show you a few tools that make it a little bit more difficult for students um, to share their answers. I mean, I've even given a multiple choice test, which I randomized all the questions and it went through our LMS and students were able to print it out and share it with one another. And so there's all kinds of unique ways that students can come up with. So I created a, a choice board here that I want to share some of these um, tools with you. The first one is Flipgrid, and probably many of you are very familiar with Flipgrid. Flipgrid does more than it's ever done before. It's a free Microsoft tool. Um, it's a video discussion platform. And under this resource page, which I'll share this um, PowerPoint with you, it gives you lots of ways that you can use it. Flipgrid.com is the actual link. So if I go out to that, let me see if it'll let me link out to that. I've actually opened a bunch of tabs on my screen here so that I can just show you how I, I set mine up. So this is an actual grid and you set up grids for your class and this can be used for any subject. I think so, if you exit the PowerPoint. Oh, okay, hang on a second. Cannot yeah. see my screen. So let's no, see, let me stop sharing share your desktop. and I will reshare my desktop. Um, too bad it's not interactive where you can go from one to the other without having to do that. Can you see that? Yes. Where's this internet addiction? Okay, yes. so this is Flipgrid. It's flipgrid.com. And basically what you do is in Flipgrid, you can set up um, what they call grids or boards. And so I teach a graduate class in educational technology. And one of the topics that we've been discussing is internet addiction or technology addiction, digital distractions, things like that. So I asked my students after we went through a module and we looked at research and talked about different things to create a Flipgrid video. And what I wanted them to do is we also looked for a, um, an entire 24 hours at their phone because your iPhones actually will tell you the stats of how much time you spend on different sites, how much time you spend on the phone, how much time you spend on social media. And so I wanted them to reflect on that. And Flipgrid's really easy. It just puts a little plus button and all they have to do is click on the little plus button and then they add their own video. So these are some of my student responses. So I wanted you to see what that looks like when a student answers a question. And so, I took out the grades because I didn't want you to see those, um, but this is a student responding to my prompt. It might be a little quiet, but you can kind of get the idea. So the student responds to the prompt. You have a rubric that you actually set up. And what's kind of cool about this is you can give them feedback and you can give them audible feedback. You can give them written feedback. Um, if they don't have an email, you can share the feedback via a link. You can um, star the video. You can spark the video, which if you hit spark, if, if a student really gives you some interesting ideas, you can spark it and that starts the next topic. Or you can remix it, which means you can take pieces of each student's video that you liked and put it all together and then share kind of one combined video. Um, in this, you can have this where students just respond to you. You can have it where all the students can see each other's videos, and so they can respond to one another, and then you can share it out. And so there's lots of different things that you can do with this. But if I just go to Flipgrid, you can see here some of my grids and then my activities. Um, there's a getting started guide, but I can add a new grid here. And then basically you sign up for free, 
and then it gives you a little code and the little code is what you share out with your students and then as long as they have the code then all of them can just click the code and then click the green plus button and record a little video so they would have to have um, a phone or something that would give them the ability to record themselves you know they'd have to have the sound uh, but you can do quite a bit of um, unique things with that i wanted to show you let's see here's a an entire guide to how you use it so that is saved for you as well move this over i saved a math lesson to show you let's see if i have it up here here it is got a lot of things up here right now let's see if i have um going to show you this math document if it comes up like it's supposed to I had it saved but I don't see it now apologize for that let's see here it is but what you can do um, is you can give math problems or science problems things like that I'm just saying oh here it is sorry have to find it okay so what you can do is like this one says check out the attached i'm opening it twice find out check out the attached file order of operations in the picture one of the expressions is solved correctly the other is incorrect your job is to find the mistakes that were made hint there's more than one in your response identify the mistakes that were made and explain the correct way to solve and give the correct value of the expression so students this is very difficult to cheat on is when they have to make a video and explain to you what's wrong with this math problem. But you could have something like they have to explain what's right with the math problem or how do you work the math problem. But it takes it to a different place than just you know a pencil paper kind of a quiz. So I'm gonna stop sharing that one and share my PowerPoint back with you again. All right, so let me see what the question in the chat is. Um, you cannot see my screen. Can, did, were you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay. All right, so Flipgrid is awesome. Flipgrid is so easy to use. Um, if you could just choose one tool for the next six weeks, I would try Flipgrid because it's probably one of the easier tools to use and the students really like it. One thing that you can do with it is when the students go in to put their little plus there, it allows them to add some little, um, emojis and different things to their picture they can put little sunglasses on their hat on their heads or hats on their head you know different things like that to kind of make it fun they only stay there for a few seconds and then um, again the, the each peer can actually you can open it to where they can comment on one another's responses as well so there's a lot of great resources there let's see what the chat says um, it'd be great for formative assessments. It would. And because you have the rubric there, you can also grade it um, and have it go into your Moodle gradebook if you want to. So another assignment that I use or another uh, tool that I use is Anchor. And so Anchor is actually a podcasting tool. It's a very easy podcasting tool. And if you're not familiar with a podcast, a podcast is basically, um, it doesn't have the video but it is a recording of the sound. And so I'm gonna show you how Anchor works. And again, I think I'm gonna to have to get out of my PowerPoint and get back in so you can see my screen. So give me one second to do that. All right, so I actually had my students create podcasts on particular topics. And so you go to Anchor and basically there's a plus and the students start talking. And I have them spend about two to five minutes on a certain concept. And so this is one that my students created. Um, and I actually gave them, because I have students all over the world in different subjects. I've got physical therapists, I've got nurses, I've got educators. I had them create their first pod podcast just to learn how to do it on a topic that was important to them. And so here's my students, is uh, acing the SAQ. And this is kind of what it sounds like. And I have a storyboard that they have to put together. And in that PowerPoint, I've actually given you the whole assignment on what I asked my students to do. And instead of me listening to all of these podcasts, 
in our LMS, which we use Canvas, I just randomly assign peer reviews and they have to peer review one another's podcast and give constructive feedback. And then based on that, I listen to maybe a minute of each one. So it's pretty quick and then give them a grade. So here's what this sounds like. Not hearing it. I'm not. Okay. It's a, I'm not sure why. I don't know if that's a Zoom setting because um, I've got my computer turned up pretty loud. Yeah. Turn it up a little bit more it's to see. Um, uh, but you get the idea. It's just same kind of concept and they can share it with one another. They basically just put the link right into our LMS in the assignment board, they put the link in there and then, you know, I, Canvas will um, randomly assign that out to the students. Now you could do it different ways. I mean, you could use Zoom and you could have breakout rooms where they actually listen to it and give audible feedback. They could put it on a Flipgrid board where students could listen to it and give them feedback that way. You know, there's lots of ways that you can use that, but a very, very easy tool and very effective. So let me go. Can you see my screen if I leave it like this? I see you, I don't see your screen. Okay. We're gonna fight the Zoom yeah. today. <laughs> it's okay. A little bit. Yeah, that's okay. Just a second and I will, um, cause I'm having to minimize everybody so that I can see my own screen to talk about it. All right, so we will share. Okay. So I'm back to the PowerPoint again. So we talked about Anchor and there is an example assignment. And I'm hoping that um, it's hard for me to know what you can see and what you can't see. So do you still see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. It's going to drive me crazy going back and forth. All right. So this is my podcast assignment that I send out to my students. And if you can't see that, let me know. Um, but it's a three to five minute podcast on a concept that they were teaching that year. And so um, basically uh, I give them a storyboard, but this is kind of what I post uh, into their LMS. The podcast has to have a name, date, location. And in their module, I teach them how to do this. I kind of show them step by step. I give them some podcasts that are really good to listen to so that they have something to refer to. I usually share one from the past semester, but again, it's very easy. Um, no slang, correct grammar. You know, they have to turn in their written script. They have to turn in their URL and those kinds of things. So again, um, it can be formative, but this actually can be summative because you can have them summarize something that you've taught them, you know, over a week or over a unit and have them, you know, there may be certain talking points that you want them to actually um, touch on in their podcast. All right, so I am back to my screen. So we've talked about Anchor, we've talked about Flipgrid. Um, Padlet is another tool, and of course I won't have time to go into a lot of detail on these. Um, if there's one particular tool that you need help with or that you're more interested in, then I can do something separate because each one of these will probably take about an hour to walk through and show you all of the things that it can do. Um, but Padlet is basically a wall. It's a virtual wall or a shelf where students can contribute ideas to one another. And we have a lot of faculty who are using Padlet this semester for final exams. They've done away with the quizzes because they're having the same problems. They don't have the proctoring that they need. Um, they're trying to look at, you know, what is the value of the quiz? Did the students get enough information in class that I don't need to give a quiz? Or if you give a quiz, make it a low stakes kind of thing, maybe not worth so many points um, and change the way that you do things. And so I'm gonna stop the screen share on this and I'm gonna show you what Padlet looks like. Hang on just one second. 
can get out of this. <laughs> I'm having a hard time managing all these different tools. I opened all these so you could see them. All right, do you see the Padlet? Not yet. Not yet, okay. And then I have to find you guys again because I keep minimizing you and you disappear on me. Let me close all these windows. Well, you guys have disappeared to where I can't get a hold of you now. None. Why am I struggling with this? There we go. Okay, sorry, it's technology. And usually I don't have uh, so many issues with this. Okay, so this is what Padlet looks like. When you um, go into Padlet, you basically have options. You can make uh, a virtual wall. It's, it reminds me a little bit of Glogster, if anybody ever used the old Glogster. Um, you can make a shelf. You can make an interactive map. But all of this uh, is free and your students get to contribute to this. And so what I wanted to show you, let me move this out of the way, is um, basically if I selected a shelf, it says this is embarrassing, try again. So let me go back. Maybe I had it on there too long, who knows. All right, so this is me. And basically you just log into padlet.com it asks you a few questions at first and then like who you are and where you work and you hit make a padlet and so i can make a padlet choose which one of these i want to and so what i did is i made a padlet just called my freshman year and i mean basically 30 seconds i started just asking questions describe your feelings to moving our class online this spring do you plan to return to campus this fall and you can just keep adding questions well, you share that with your students and then they get to respond. So they click the plus, their name pops up, it'll ask them who they are. Um, and then they can add pictures, images, anything like that, and they just keep responding to whatever questions you have. Now, I made mine just, you know, random questions, but you could make them very specific about your content. If you were in literacy, perhaps, and you had um, several different books they had to read, you know, you could have them talk about um, a particular novel, have them talk about the antagonist in the story. You could have them talk about, um, you know, compare and contrast different things that happened. But you, there's a lot of um, opportunities with this Padlet. And so it's something to consider because it is free, it's easy to use, and students actually like it. They like the fact that they can add images, they can add videos in here. You know, the only thing that I would, um, warn you about is just you know talking to your students beforehand about expectations you know the the language has to be appropriate the videos you choose have to be appropriate things like that but this is an interactive collaborative board so all of your students can see what everyone posts let's see what the question is in chat um, you can make it to where everyone sees each other's or you can make it individually most of the time faculty make it collaborative where everyone can see everyone else's answers, but you don't have to. Um, you can make that an independent board. And when you're setting that up, you have those options. You have all kinds of options. Um, you honestly can also go through the gallery and you can remix and use any of the ones that are in here. Um, you know, here's a book report for fifth grade. I know this is not fifth grade, but you can put pictures in here. And so these are different students. Um, this student read the number of stars, this one read the holes, this read the giver, so that obviously the, um, the teacher has asked them to give an introduction, a summary, you know, talk about the characters in the book. So because this, these students read individual books, everyone can read about each other's books and choose the books that they like, but um, there's just different ways to use it. But yes, you can set it up independently or you can set it up collaboratively like this one was. All right, so I'm gonna do a new share. Let's try a new share and see how that works if I do it that way. All right, so that's Padlet. Easy, easy. Um, Mentimeter and Go Soapbox. Go Soapbox is sort of a new tool, and because of time, I'm not gonna go into detail on it, but it allows for a variety of types of quizzes, multiple choice, 
um, it works on any device. We're going to come back to that because there's some things that are like it that I think are just as good, maybe better. Mentimeter allows you again to do online polls and quizzes. Um, you can create questions. It gives you a URL. It, there, these are all ways to create quizzes and share them online for free. Um, Go Formative uh, again allows you to do uh, to make quizzes online, share those quizzes with your students, and um, grades them. The only issue I have with the Go Formative is that it's limited with the free version. I haven't seen a premium version yet, and you can't randomize the order of the quizzes. And so it's got a lot of great features, but that's one that I don't think is that great. Um, but I do want to share this one with you. It's called TED Ed. And at any time, if you can't see me, you can't see my screen, you can't hear me, please let me know. Um, TED Ed is one of my favorites, and I use it a lot. And I actually have that, I think, on my screen here. Can everyone see my screen? No. No. Okay. So you see your PowerPoint. Share. Okay. Can you see the TED Ed screen now? No. No. We can't. See your PowerPoint. <laughs> it's gonna drive me crazy. Now we do. We see TED Ed. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I went to the main page of TED Ed, and what you do on TED Ed is TED Ed is like a flipped video classroom. Um, you will log in as an educator and once you do that you can also ask your students to log in as students and you will give them a unique code and that unique code will allow for um, grading to be done you know all kinds of great things so I'm going to show you says hi Julie this is not logged in but I am actually logged in I think what it is I created a new account um, you can discover lessons which I love this if you record your own videos, you can put them in here as well. But this has, this has great YouTube videos, great TED Ed videos, great National Geographic types of videos. So let's just pick one. What is a coronavirus? It seems like what we're talking about right now. And so you can remix these videos. It's got, this is a TED Ed animation. It was originally created by Elizabeth Cox. And so there's a video here. And this is kind of the teacher side of things, but your students will see something very similar. So they'll watch the video, then it'll have thinking questions, and it'll actually test them over whatever video they watch. So the word in Corona in Latin, and you know, you will know this from watching the video. And then it gives them, move this control bar out of my way. Um, it gives them another question and another question. As the educator, I can see what all those questions are. If you don't like the questions, you can add your own. You can delete any of these questions that you don't want. Um, you don't have to use them at all if you don't want to. So it shows you there's five multiple choice and five open answer. There's a dig deeper section. Sometimes I use these and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I leave them on there for an optional assignment. And then there's a discussion. And you can choose, you know, which discussion you like. You can view the discussions. And you can customize, which what I really, this is what I do, is I customize the lessons that I like. And when you do this, you can change any of this, any of this that you want to. Um, and then when you, you can adjust these settings, but then you hit publish and it tells you your lesson is successfully published. And then you share this lesson with your students and it will give you um, a one page kind of summary of how all of your students did, how much time they spent on the lesson, you know, what questions they missed, what questions they got right. And so I, I assign these as points. I make them low stake points. Um, depending on what they have to do, it might be worth 25 points, but that adds up. And so here's the original. And then of course you see the one that I remixed. But what's great is it has every subject level, you know, it's organized by series. And so here's the periodic videos. Um, this is all about science. And you can search for things, you know, if you have a certain topic that you're teaching, um, the quadratic formulas. Just put in quadratic. And so there's something on that. Um, if you don't find what you want, then what you can do is you can create your own lesson from your video. Students can create, create their own talks in class. I haven't done this because I usually use Flipgrid for that. Um, and then you can learn how to do it. So 
but you can create your own lesson. Here's where you can look for a YouTube video, or if you find one on the internet, you can paste it in there and it automatically puts it into the lesson format where you can begin to add your own questions. Super, super easy. And it's probably one of my very favorite tools um, to use with students. All right, I'm being mindful of my time here because I know I have more to share than what I have time. All right, so I am going to now go back to my PowerPoint. And hello. Can you, let's see. see. We see your PowerPoint. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. I need you. Yeah. All right. I just closed all my windows down. That's okay. Because when I look at the PowerPoint, it's now kind of showing that it's green and different colors. And so it's doing weird things, but that's okay. All right. So we talked about TED Ed. Some of these I'm going to go through just a little bit quicker because of time. Um, Ed Puzzle and Play Posit, they both do the same thing. And basically what they do is um, very similar to TED Ed. Uh, I find TED Ed, because I've used it a lot, to be uh, pretty user friendly. These two, a lot of our faculty use it. They integrate very well with Moodle and Canvas and uh, Blackboard, but they are also interactive videos. Um, what you can do on these is you have a video in there. You can stop a video at a particular point and you can add in um, comments you can delete all the audio off of the video if you want to so i just saw one on the coronavirus maybe i don't want that speaker to talk about the coronavirus i just want to use their slides so i can use their slides and then i can override um, their slides with my own audio but you can stop those at little places and you can put questions in and then those questions can be graded as well same thing with um, socrates very similar where uh, you use videos, same thing with Pear Deck. Those are all very, very similar. They're flipping the classroom. Um, in Play Posit, we call that uh, basically a video bulb lesson. And the links are here for you, where you create a bulb, you title it, you basically, um, on both of these, you can choose whether you want students to be able to rewind the video, to listen to it again in order to answer the questions. And I'm gonna show you you know, an example of one of these in just a minute. Um, again, all of these, you get an embed code, and so you can give students that code um, to listen to. So let me um, just go like, let me just pick one of these, because they're basically the same. Let me open that up, and then I'm gonna stop share, and I'm gonna show you my screen. Just a second, once it opens up. All right crazy I'm having to find you every time I, I open a screen all right so this can you see this where it yes. says Edpuzzle yes okay all right so this is Edpuzzle and again it has a lot of videos already in there for you I need to verify my account because I just signed up quickly with Google um, but you can choose curriculum you can choose different channels if you want a Khan Academy a TED talk to pick a video and so let me just pick one of these that's already done. This is a Mythbusters video. And you can see down here all these little um, marks, look like little raindrops. Those are where interactive questions uh, have been added in the video. So here's the video. And then over here, the faculty has added, stopped the video and added these questions. What is the independent variable in the experiment? And you can see there's a grade book here and then a place to set your classes up so all the grades will be dumped into that class. But the student can choose and then they can say rewatch, skip, submit. This is where you have the option that they can't skip a question. They have to actually try to answer it. And then the student submits it and it says I missed it because <laughs> I just guessed. I didn't read it. Um, and then it says you can continue or you can rewatch the video. So that's kind of what Edpuzzle does. That's very similar to what uh, Play Posit would be very similar to that as well. So just for the sake of time, I'm gonna go rather quickly. Can you see my PowerPoint again? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, Kahoot, Quizlet Live, and Quizzes. Um, they are uh, 
quick ways to assess your students. And I actually have my students build Kahoot questions. I provide that assignment for you. Quizlet Live is rather new. Um, it's been added and it is a premium feature that you can get until the end of June. You can sign up and be part of that uh, premium feature for free right now. And so you can create really interactive types of quizzes online and then give your students the URL where they can take the quiz and it grades them. They play against each other in these three and they don't have to be synchronous. Um, some teachers, what they choose to do is they choose to uh, create an online Zoom session where all of the students join online and just like we're doing right now. And then that teacher says, okay, I'm going to start the Kahoot quiz or I'm going to start the Quizlet live and they'll give the code to the students and they'll all take it at the same time. And what that does is once all the students are done, if you've ever used any of those products before, um, it will have a analysis of how the students did. It's anonymous, it won't tell you who they are, but it'll show you like how many picked A, how many picked B, and then the teacher can kind of have a review synchronously together in an online environment. But you don't have to, you can create and you can do those um, independently, and then the teacher can share that out later if they want to. Um, Google Forms, you can also make quizzes in Google Forms if anybody's ever used Forms. If you haven't, I've given you a link on how to use Forms. But what's new on Google Forms is there's a extension called Fluberoo. If you add that extension, Fluberoo, it will grade all of your Google Forms and put those into a spreadsheet for you. And so all of your students will have uh, a grade there and you're not having to self-grade that. All you have to do is create the quiz and share out the link. All of these products are pretty much like that. They'll all provide a grade for you, and then you just have to enter it into your LMS. Um, poll Everywhere is a polling. It's exactly what it says. It's a, uh, a polling site where you create a poll, an interactive poll for your students. And the one thing that I like about uh, Poll Everywhere now is that um, there is a feature, and I've given you the link to it, where you can actually, if you click on this, you'll get the link to it you can actually put it into your PowerPoint. So it's an add-on in PowerPoint. And so you create your PowerPoint, then you can put a poll. Does everyone understand this? And your students can actually take that poll and they can do it synchronously or they can do it asynchronously on their own time. And then it'll give you the results of that. Then you can share that out with your students if you want to later. Again, Pear Deck is very similar. All of these are kind of different kinds of forms and assessments that you can use that are very interactive with your students. Some of them are like Play Posit and Ed Puzzle and Socrative are video based. Um, these other ones are more like uh, an app, an online quiz that your students take. And then of course, Google Forms can do all kinds of things. Um, let me go to the next slide real quick. So I, I know I'm running out of time, but I wanted to share a couple of things that I do um, with my students instead of giving tests, besides all of those other tools. I have given my students OneNote notebooks. OneNote's a free tool. It's a Microsoft tool where they do reflective journals. And so um, one of the things that I have my students do in a summer class is I have a guest speaker come in just like today uh, via Zoom and talk to my students about certain concepts. And so my students have to use their journal to reflect on what they learned from that speaker. And so I have them do it in a OneNote uh, class notebook and I give them points for that. So I've given you that assignment if you want to see how I set that up. I've also had students, um, I teach an assistive technologies class and also I, I taught classroom management for years and also a science STEM class. And so the things that my students created during the year, I had them put it into a, a summative portfolio. And so I used Pathbright, which is a, a particular portfolio, and I think our university still may be using that quite a bit. You may have portfolios built into uh, your LMS. If you don't, Wix is a really good one. I use it for my own personal portfolios. Weebly, WordPress, those are all really good where students can um, have a summative portfolio, a capstone kind of project at the end of the semester, and you can have them do that and you can assign a rubric to that. Um, Google Docs is another tool that I use. And this is, um, 
a breakout room, my students had to create escape rooms. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I've given you an example and I'm gonna just see if I can open that so you can kind of see what my students created. And this is the assignment that they had to do. So they had to take what they learned. That one didn't work. So we're gonna do it this way. I thought I checked every one of these. Okay, it doesn't wanna work with the, the sharing. So I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna open it from my desktop. Find my desktop. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to reshare because it seems to be the way that it wants to work today. It's not wanting to work. <laughs> the technology person is having problems with technology today. My PowerPoint doesn't want to quit. Okay. It's actually pretty reassuring. <laughs> For those of you know, us who are a little bit less adept, it's actually reassuring. Um, sometimes that is just what happens. Right. Can you see, are you able to see my desktop with me? No. We're seeing okay. you, not the desktop. Not okay, the well, it's probably better to see me right now until I find what I'm looking for, then I'll share it with you. Um, so my students created digital breakouts. It's, they're basically escape rooms, and I had them take the uh, information that they learned in a unit or in the course and create a game. So it was a, that's an assessment. If they have to take all of the things that they learned, all of the information and create one location, a game that someone else could play, um, it's pretty impressive. So, or at least it was to me. All right, so I am going to see if I can find an example of that. And I, I apologize, I had all of these um, great ideas saved on my desktop and so some of them didn't um they just didn't stay in there for whatever reason but that's okay if i don't find that one then i'm i'll take questions because that was the last one that i was going to talk to you about today anyway plus you provided links through the powerpoint which we'll share with right and i need to i'll fix that last link so that you can actually see these documents um all right let's see if this one Okay, so let me share my screen. I have to find you guys again. For some reason, you, um, you, min you are minimized, very small. All right, so this is an example of a, a breakout activity. And I have my students pretend like they're teachers and they have to go in and they have to uh, pick a topic that we've talked about. And this is an example, like if we were talking about the Holocaust, um, what would the standards be? And then what's the rationale? And then they have to talk about what's, this is all gonna go into a game. What's the introduction? What's the background? And what URLs are you gonna use in your digital breakout? Such as videos, newspapers, maps. Anyway, this is kind of the storyboard. What are the rules and the parameters? Um, if you've ever seen a digital breakout or an escape room, basically there are locks and you create puzzles. My students create puzzles and you can't solve it until you answer the questions and all of the clues. And so um, it's a little higher level thinking. It's way up there with the creation and the synthesis and blooms, but I'd be happy to show you some of these digital breakouts. You can Google them as well. Um, there's thousands of people out there creating these games. See if I, I was going to show you my own personal students, but I can't seem to pick one up right now. Um, let's see if someone's got one out there. A lot of people charge you for these, but you can make your own. And so there's lots of activities, but they look like this. They're really fun and interactive, um, look like a video game. And so you go in and the first page says to unlock this room, you must answer this question. This question is, and you know, whatever the question is, the students have to answer it. And it's usually like, a four digit, it'd be like maybe what is the year that uh, World War II ended? Or what is the date? And you have to put in the specific day, time, year, all of that to unlock that code. And once you put that in there, then it unlocks and they get to go to the next page. And so um, pretty cool stuff. But again, it would probably take me an hour to uh, talk to you about, you know, how to do that. And so um, let me see if there's anything else that I have for you. I kind of made myself some notes. I guess I'd, I'm open to questions. 
you know, some of the questions that you're struggling with, because I really don't know um, what it is that you're facing as far as, you know, giving assessments, because there's multiple ways um, to do that and multiple tools out there. So are there questions about, uh, you know, things that you're facing or things that you need help on? We have a small group today, so you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, it's Arlene. Um, so for my, my, my classes, sometimes I would give them peer, peer review videos or forums. Uh, one of my problems is that they would give really high grades to each other all the so, time and I, it's hard to, to address that. So what I do with that is um, I don't make the peer review more than like 25 points. First of all, um, I build it into a rubric. And so the students have to, in that assignment, they have to have, let's say for the podcast, they have to have, it has to be three to five minutes. I mean, it's very specific. So those peers have to go in and say, was it three to five minutes? Did it have music? Was the sound clear? And so they're going through a rubric as they do that. Um, you know, was it submit? was it submitted to our group? We have a group page. Was it submitted to the group page? So each of those things get, get points, but I don't let them just go in and just, you know, randomly make up some points. If it's worth a hundred points, which I think that assignment probably is worth a hundred points. They can't just give a hundred and say, this was great. You know, it, it's very specific criteria. Once you set up that criteria in that rubric, it's a lot easier. I mean, you're going to have some of that. And I let my students know, Hey, I'm going to go back and listen to this. I'm going to watch this. Uh, you know, and, and double check and then we'll combine the averages or however you want to set that up. But I usually give them just 25 points for doing the peer review and then um, I go through there and just check off the rest of the things for the rest of the points. Anybody else? Does that answer your Yeah, yeah, that answers my question. I think, um, like I have had like detailed rubrics online for them to assess and then despite of the rubric, they still give like a hundred over a hundred. So that's exactly what I've done. Um, like go over the question and, um, and just take away the points that, that shouldn't be there. Yeah. And, and again, if you, if they do that and you only make that worth 25 points of the grade and then you grade the rest of it according to a certain scale, then that 25 points, if that's all they got, it's not going to help them that much, even if they gave them a hundred. I mean, I don't do it so much that they grade it. I just, I do it to kind of force them to listen to one another. And I, sometimes when I, my students share almost every assignment that they create with one another because it kind of builds in this competition and they see one student's being posted and shared, then they want theirs to be better and it wanted to look better and you know so we have a group facebook page where we share all of our projects and then they can ask for help i mean it's uh it's more about learning than it is about assessing hi martha here um i had a question uh for example with padlet um we would have to make an account but do does each student have to create an account to use that as well um, you do not have to, this, on that one, you don't have to create an account on that one. Um, you can share the link. There's different ways that you can do that. The, the teacher can just share the link and then uh, make it open to the public. There's, you can make it private as long as they have a password and they can go in and write things on the board without having an account. And accounts don't cost anything. There's no, in Padlet, there's no purpose really of them creating an account. They don't have to. Okay, I'm going to just wrap up a little bit here and um, see if I can share my screen. Uh, let's see. Briefly here, we just have another minute. All right, well, so, you know, we do wanna 
be calm, take a breath, uh, be as clear and as straightforward as we can, and create simple solutions for students and for yourself. I do think that um, Dr. DeLello's tools that she shared um, offer us a number of ways to uh, create some of those simple solutions. And I would encourage you to pick one or two um, and know that we always have summer and fall to get, to get better at um, and wish you the very best. Um, I also want to just point this out to you, July 23rd and 24th, you're uh, welcome to attend a COBEC uh, online conference. Um, there'll be more information coming out to you soon, so we would encourage you to come to that if you want. And I've included this as a, um, as a little bit of further reading. It's an Edutopia article. They usually have good articles, and this one is as well. Uh, teaching through a pandemic, which is a place that we're all at. And I will um, stop sharing my screen now and return to uh, return to our page and uh, just give you another few seconds if anybody has another question. I see some uh, great comments. I'm glad that you, you learned a lot um, from this. And thank you, Dr. DeLello, for sharing your expertise. It's, it's fascinating. You're welcome. So, so the, the, these materials will be shared uh, with Dr. Pura. Um, and um, you will have it. All right. I'm going to... Uh, End the end the session now. Dr. Delello, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, if you need something, feel free to reach out to me if you have further questions. Um, I will be presenting again at the next conference, and it will be like the top ten teaching tools. And so um, maybe we can go into a little bit more depth on some of these. And so I hope to see you this summer. Well, thank you all and wishing you the best. I'm also available for questions as well. I'm ending the call now, so take care and have a wonderful day.